Hello, greetings and welcome, my dear, dear listeners. My name is Critical Hatter, and I welcome you to the 10th episode of my little series, The Tao Empire Reimagined. And today I intend to make a little shorter episode, uh, mostly focused on environment of the collision space, about which I spoke a little bit, but I think that many of you aren't fully aware of the nature of this region of space, and about a certain event connected to those four lovely people in the 40k galaxy known as Chaos Gods. Because we can't have nice things in this galaxy, and sooner or later, someone will come and try to break it. So, my darlings, sit back, relax, get a snack or something hot to drink, and please enjoy yourself as we dive deep into the collision space and an event known as the first pulse. Now, let's have a little talk in regards of the collision space, or, well, the region of space that they control. The vast majority of you most likely are aware of how the Imperium of Mankind divided the galaxy. The galaxy, the Milky Way, is divided into five segmentums, and each segmentum is divided into multiple sectors. Each sector have their own fleets, their own command structure, and basically they are akin to individual states that are almost semi-independent. Like, usually everything that a sector needs comes and is produced within that sector. One of the most famous sectors of all is Ultramar, the 500 worlds created by Robota Gilliman many thousand or years ago. If you look at the map here right now, you will notice the presence of the Tau Empire. And all of you will notice that the Tau Empire depicted on this map is significantly bigger compared to the Tau Empire depicted on official Warhammer 40k maps. Why exactly Games Workshop doesn't really like look at uh, how the Tau Empire expands in canon? and basically doesn't change the size uh, of the Tau Empire since the very first time they showed up. It's an anathema to me, but uh, it would be a first time when Games Workshop just totally failed doing what should be obvious in terms of world building. Now, in my rewrite, I decided to keep the Tauva Coalition to be of similar size in terms of territory that they control compared to the Tau Empire. And by all accounts, they are around a size of a bigger sector. As you probably noticed, not all sectors are created equal. Some are far bigger, 
some are far smaller than the others. And that's basically the size I'm going with. Here you have a map of the collision space, with some anomalies which are known to you from the canon. The strange white line which creates a perfect circle, that's the warp storms about which we knew in the canon. One of the main reasons why the Tau Empire wasn't uh, exterminated and allowed to grow in the canonical 40k was because of the presence of a warp storm. It's just for some reason people or creators at Games Workshop didn't really think about the fact that it would be one of the biggest and long-lasting uh, warp storms uh, in the galaxy. Nor how those warp storms would affect not only the Tau Empire, but also the member species of the Tau Empire. I mean the idea that the empire that developed and grew in power being within a warp storm didn't really have that much of experience with demons or chaos is laughable. I know that in canon ethereals are aware, but keep it quiet. But it's not really that satisfying. Like, they are aware of the dangers, but they didn't really face against those terrors, uh, against those dangers in the past, as far as we know. I will be changing that. So, the map you see here, all of that is contained within this region of space, basically. Nothing impressive in terms of size, but I always felt that the Tau space lacked the standard 40k feel with the anomalies, with the strangeness, which many sectors do have. Of all the anomalies that you see here on the map, only two are present in the canonical lore, and that's Perdus Rift and Damocles Gulf, which I renamed to Damocles Rift. The Damocles Gulf is all the space, uh, basically the entire collision space. And why it's named that way? It's because as the warp storms formed and new anomalies took shape, the Imperials were quite sure that Damocles Rift, Dionysus Rift, Teros Nebula, Burning Wall, Perdus Rift and Blackheart Bay were all fully connected, creating a bay. After the warp storms will finally fall apart, it would be discovered that no, they aren't as closely connected, but the name would stick, because Imperial Administration. So, at the start of this episode, I would like to expand more upon the anomalies which you can see on the map right now. Some of them are similar to each other, some are completely different from one another. About some I already spoke, in greater or smaller detail. But vast majority of them Mm, sees their beginning or at least strengthening of their mm, abilities or characteristics in the appearance of this massive sector-wide 
warp storm, which lasted around 5000 years. I mean, if you look on the map, this warp storm was of similar size, although far weakened in power, than mm, the Eye of Terror. Here is an important thing, and I want to, well, the fans of 40k to not freak out. The Whoop Storm in this region of space took a form of a, basically a sphere, a thin sphere. It wasn't just, well, the Eye of Terror, just miasma of chaos pouring into a real space. It seemed almost as if warp was containing something within a sphere. You could still glimpse into a sphere from time to time, but it was too dangerous to travel within, at least for everyone who wasn't a bloody orc. And I said it before, but I want to clarify it for those who might have forgotten, that this warp storm was interesting. Many warp storms or anomalies in 40k release, you know, demons and chaos fleets into the real space. This warp storm was extremely tame in comparison. I mean, in regards to that it was still a warp storm and you can't fly through it, but Demons didn't really come out of it, nor Chaos Fleets. The only thing that they it da, did throughout the ages that the Imperium noticed was it orc invasions and orc war from time to time. It was studied and it was analyzed, and the only thing that people were certain of was that some kind of energy, not warp energy, was pouring out of the heart of this region of space. And the warp storm was almost like a re reaction of the body to an infection. Like antibodies trying to contain whatever was trying to get in. And some of you might think, well, that's a bit of a stretch. But we do have examples of all the realities mm, breaking the veil between the worlds and pouring into the 40k. Of course, there is the warp, but I am not talking about it. I'm talking about the Ghoul Stars. The Ghoul Stars is a region of space full with terrifying monsters and beings beyond human comprehension that aren't demons. They are monstrous, they are eldritch, but they aren't chaos. In fact, they seem totally unconnected with the warp in general. And I thought that maybe something was trying to get in and found the entrance somewhere in the Coalition space. The warp managed to contain it somewhat. But it doesn't mean that this conflict between those two energies didn't create some kind of anomalies. The most important of all is the Broken Heart which is, as the name suggests, in the very center of this sphere, of this region of space. I spoke about the Broken Heart a little bit, and I will repeat it here in short version. The Broken Heart is a region of space where numerous black holes fly in very intended pattern, creating almost like a barrier uh, in the very center of this region of space, 
just making this region impossible to travel. Even for someone like, for example, Votan, who travel in the core of a galaxy, this singular anomaly will be extremely dangerous to enter and impossible to navigate. The Coalition made contact with this anomaly some time ago and were studying it for quite some time. But they couldn't really enter it. It's clear that it's full of gas, like a nebula, and numerous very small black holes who fly on very clear orbits around the very heart of uh, this region of space. And there is very clearly something in the middle. Hell, some pictures even show some kind of structures within, but it's really not clear what the hell those are. The broken heart is a mystery, and it can be observed, but it can't be studied directly because how dangerous travel within is. But it most certainly seem to be a designed anomaly. Now, let's move to the most classic anomalies in this region of space, which are rifts. The Dionysus Rift, the Damocles Rift and Perdus Rift are extremely similar to each other. They have very similar nature. They are regions so anomalous that they bend not only the real space, but also the immaterium. From the perspective of warp traveling vessels, those three rifts are like a region of sea with just a lot of r very sharp rocks. You don't. <laughs> you don't sail in their direction. Hell, they even deflect some of the warp currents, making the travel through them very dangerous and very difficult for basically every single faction in 40k. It's not like the Imperium can just go into the warp and move through it without any problem, no. Those rifts do influence warp and make it extremely dangerous. They aren't warp storms, but they infect or in, uh, have influence over both real space and immaterium at the same time. Imagine a region of space where Stars, nebulas, and planets, and asteroids move in anomalous patterns and strange orbits that change almost at will. There is some, well, level of predictive, you know, you can predict to some point how they will move, but it isn't, it's not certain at any point of time. When you are within the rift, there are visual anomalies and illusions. Like a star which you see and you can detect on your second source doesn't really exist, for example. It's almost like the rifts bend not only material and immaterial uh, well, realities, but also time. That a thing that already happened or will happen, you can see it. You can't, you can't touch it, but you can see it. You can detect it. The Coalition managed to breach the Perdus Rift and establish few navigable routes through it but they aren't stable and they can, must be constantly corrected and enforced, because if not, 
the path will be broken. In fact, they started to study the ways to force like a tunnel within the Perdus Rift that would help in, well, just travel. How they intend to do it? By using a Gellar field within the real space. As you most likely know, Gellar fields are needed to create a bo bubble of reality uh, for a vessel that travels through warp. And this Gellar field is usually, well, on a low setting power, can be used within uh, those rifts, the Damocles rift, the Perdus rift and Dionysus rift to help with navigation. It's one of very few regions of space where the Gellar field can be used in the real space on very low power setting and it won't break or explode just by you know, interfering with creating bubble of reality within a reality. It's, it's not healthy in most cases. Now, another two very similar anomalies are Keshi Nebula and Teros Nebula. And they are basically what they sound like. They are nebulas, but as you probably see, they were connected with the warp storm. So they are anomalous and harder to navigate through. Not as hard as Perdus and Damocles and Dionysus rifts, but it's not easy. Just the sensors will get confused, will start directing you in the strange directions, just you need to be really, really certain to fly in the right direction. Now, probably my favorite anomaly of them all, which one I called the Burning Wall. The Burning Wall was originally a nebula, which was fully engulfed by a warp storm. And now it's a region of absolute madness, because it's a region where stars break apart, form and transform at the same time. Imagine a region of space where you can observe entire life cycle of a star. From a moment which they were nebula and were gathering to create stars, when the stars create, were born for the first time, when they exploded, create, turned into pulsars and supernovas, at the same time. It's a burning wall because this nebula is almost always on fire. This region of space is 100% impossible to traverse. I mean, maybe a vessel will survive, but the crew won't. If your vessel has ability to punch through a pulsar and supernova at the same time, you will most likely survive. If not, pack your stuff and go somewhere else. The next one I want to discuss is a frozen storm. And the frozen storm is very cute anomaly by comparison to all others. The frozen storm is a region of space where there is something that looks like nebula, but it isn't a stardust. It's water and glass for the most part. It's just giant region of frozen water. In some places, even though there are stars within the frozen storm, 
the ice doesn't melt. It's extremely anomalous, extremely weird, but it is traversable. In fact, you can make a holiday just fly through this frozen storm and observe it. It's so, it is somewhat dangerous if you are really fucking stupid, but you can navigate through it. The only anomaly that is present here is that water that should, shouldn't be forming into ice is forming into ice. And there's also glass among it and some kind of crystals that only form and only stay, stay in the same form within the storm. Very bizarre region of space. But nice holiday destination. The next one is the Beast's Eye. And the Beast's Eye is interesting because it got its name because it was infected by the orcs. As you probably remember, the Great Orc Wa, uh, I talk about it in the 8th episode, many orcs found refuge in the Beast's Eye. And you might ask, well, why did they hit there? The answer is very simple. It's because it's a breeding ground for space whales, who fly in this region of space. And the orcs being orcs, they like fishes, and they are fishing there. The beast's eye will be pain in the ass for the coalition for a very long time. Talking about orcs, we have Beast's Teeth, which were created where the first orc war breached the sphere of warp storms and created those strange teeth-like anomalies. And they are almost like... well, just anomalous region of space. Imagine an anomaly created by the orcs simply by their passing. They are regions of unstable anomalies where sensors go haywire. It's really irritating to go through them. It's not impossible, but it's pain in the ass. And the last anomaly is Black Heart Bay. And Black Heart Bay is a region of space most clearly touched by chaos. Of all the region of space, this anomaly represents or is similar to the Eye of Terror or other similar warp storms the most. It is both similar and different to the rifts I talked about before. The only thing that you should know as of now, is that it's more chaotic, if you will. And now, as I spoke about all the different anomalies within the collision space, let's talk about the first pulse, an event that was quite anomalous and caused quite a ruckus in the collision space. Imagine, if you will, a quiet flight through the stars. You are just a simple pilot of a merchant vessel, and you are transporting some standard goods from one system to another, going through ether, you well, using ether drive or skip drive, however you prefer to call it. It's slow in comparison to a warp, but hell, no demons to eat your ass, so not really much of a problem there now, is it? You're just relaxing, just looking at the instruments, talking with your crew, and just having casual fun 
as your vessel quietly and calmly flies faster than light. Quite similar to what we could expect from hyperspace travel in the Star Wars universe. And then, out of nowhere, alarms blare, lights shudder and switch off, and your ship is violently ripped through the, mm, from the FTL into the real space. Your crew falls on the ground, you barely manage to catch yourself, you stand up, look at the instruments, they go, go haywire for around an hour, and you are just panicking one hour or just looking around, what the hell went wrong? The engine seems okay, the drives didn't explode, everyone seems fine, and after an hour, everything seems to calm down. And you think, well shit, I mean maybe it's just a freak accident? Uh, I mean, it's very rare for vessels with ether drive to be lost and or experience some catastrophe, but maybe you just... something weird happened, something that your instruments here on the... on board can detect, and you just manage to dodge a bloody do bullet. So you check everything twice, thrice, four times, everything is fine. Alright, it's time to get back into the FTL speed, get to the nearest port and try to figure out what the fuck went wrong. So you make the jump, you arrive at, uh, at your destination and you see a shit ton of vessels, far more than what usually are present in the port. You look through the comms, you contact other ships, and you find out that literally every single vessel with ether drive or warp drive, every single vessel of the coalition was suddenly pulled out of the FTL the same way you did, and at the same time, or very similar time, at least. Congratulations, my friend, because you are one of the few who directly experience the pulls, or the first pulls, at will, as it will be known in the future. 666th year of 39th millennium, or year 4613, era of unity. Suddenly, and without any warning, a strange energy pulls uh, from the broken heart emitted towards the warp storm that surrounds this region of space, and violently pulled out every single vessel in transit in the entire region of space. The panic is significant. The communications were cut for a few weeks, like the vessels, the courier ships that were in transit were pulled out and moved to the closest port to check what the fuck went wrong instead of moving further. So. It takes a bit of time for the coalition to reconnect. Everything seems fine, but it, definitely something happened. There are many questions asked, but no one has an answer. Or at least no one is saying it out loud. In the chambers of the highest governor of officials of the coalition, talks are in progress. Every single psychar of the coalition felt the pulse. 
and what's worse, the pools wasn't singular. Yes, the pools which was affected everything, uh, the communications, the vessels in transit, uh, even uh, electricity on planets and space stations in some cases for few minutes or an hour, which caused a shit ton of chaos and panic, wasn't isolated anomaly. Because almost like a reflection, just as the pools uh, um, started in the broken heart and moved to the uh, warp storm which surrounded the universe of space, something else pushed uh, pools back towards the heart. Far weaker, but it moved through the warp mostly. A wave of rage and bloodlust and madness. In fact, soon enough, reports came that the sphere of warp storm seemed a little bit weaker than before. And every single proper psyker and members of psychic organizations within the coalition called a warning to all high officials that something was coming. Something was coming towards the coalition, towards the broken heart, and they had to act fast to protect themselves. Ethereals didn't have connection with the warp, but let's say that the pools scared the ever living shit out of them enough to start acting. Immediately, the special forces and the police were sent out and special units created to look for or very aggressive people, trying to calm them down, isolate them, doing everything in their power to find infections of rage, if you will, and isolate them and cut them from the rest of the society to stop the spread. The psychers were very important in this task, allowing them to gain more influence during the whole operation. But the other thing that happened was that not long after, sensors and patrol fleets started to encounter fleets of maddened beasts. We talk beastmen, we talk mutants, we talk humans, we talk xenos of different types, bo on board of different vessels, traveling in sporadic or bigger fleets, gunning towards the broken heart at full speed. This period of time was officially named the Fourth Coalition War, and it lasted exactly 30 Terran years, from 666 a millennium 39 to 696 millennium 39 or by the Tao calendar 4613 to 4649 era of unity the fourth coalition war was one of inconsistency because the enemies were gunning on them from all directions, but they were just unconnected with each other. They were fighting almost as individual fleets, not connected in anything else, but only the goal of gunning towards the broken heart and nothing else. So it was low intensity conflict, but very bloody one. There were attempts at diplomacy, at contact, but those fleets of maddened people and Xenos was, were just crashing into the Coalition space and attacking everything in their way. And the Coalition, thanks to their preparations and good navy, and their experience fighting with orcs, could handle them quite well. 
In fact, despite the uh, fact that the war lasted 30 years, the coalition suffered very little to no casualties. At least in some eg engagements they were just running around this enemy and firing at them. Some ships that were entering the coalition space weren't even warships. They were transport filled with berserkers and they were just gunned down before they could land on any planet and deal any real damage. There were some colonies and some outposts which were destroyed, sure, but compared to the war with the orcs, this was nothing. Like, those fleets were less cohesive and less organized than the orcs in their desire to find bloodshed. Which is both impressive and very, very confusing. Because how quiet this war was, in many ways, the wider public didn't really knew about it. The attacks were described as attacks of the some kind of pirates or aggressive xenos or factions that were nomadic in nature. The pose itself was explained as some kind of, for now, unknown anomaly caused by interactions between the black holes within the broken heart. Some even gave explanations that around the sphere that surrounded this region of space, most likely some aggressive cults were created, and this pose was almost worked as a call for them to move on to some kind of holy war towards the broken heart, and the coalition was simply on their path and simply defended themselves. Within the 30 years, the conflict basically ended. If you even could call it a conflict, with the supremacy in the void, putting down those modern berserkers wasn't really a challenge. And some of you most likely figured out that this wasn't just a freak accident. This is a work of Chaos Gods. Or, well, this Mad Rush was more specifically connected to Horn, the god of war and bloodshed. However, the war itself lasted exactly 30 Terran years. And what you get if you add together the holy numbers of the Chaos Gods? 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6. 30. Oh yes, my darlings. The Dark Gods finally decided to do something about this region of space. And the first pulse, the first call for spreading chaos in this region of space went to Korn, who fucked up. His call was one of blind and mad rage. One with a goal, but without organization. Sure, it was dangerous to some, and many species did suffer because of it, but when those fleets arrived at the doorstep of a coalition, uh, and faction that survived an orc war, they really weren't that impressive just disjointed madmen who were rushing in comparatively small fleets into well-defended regions of space. So it wasn't a Black Crusade or anything, but most definitely something did happen. There was also the fact that 
the infection of rage, as some started to call it, did spread a little bit within the coalition. But it was quickly put down, like isolated, located, and cured one way or another. The only exception, one that was stricken from the records, was when a singular crude war sphere was infected and entire war sphere had to be destroyed among all the crude on board to ensure that this madness wouldn't spread further. So yes, the coalition experienced for the very first time the touch of chaos and so that even the members of the coalition can be corrupted or at least blessed by the gulf of blood and war. As you could probably guess, this wasn't really ideal from the coalition perspective, and most definitely not from the perspective of Ethereals. I mean, the fact that there was something that could influence the coalition and send armies into their region of space to fight them was problematic. The fourth coalition war, despite being relatively low intensity, was mm, dangerous enough that the expansion stopped. Like, the coalition decided that we are not taking any chances, we are fully focused on controlling and looking through the population we have to isolate examples of a very aggressive and just maddened people, which work extremely well, and we keep an eye on any potential fleets that could overpower our defenses. None did, but they weren't taking any chances. After the last fleet was destroyed and, by all accounts, nothing else was coming to threaten the coalition, current Ethereal Supreme, Aung Thor, decided that a proper counterattack was in order. It was an ambitious project named The Long Journey. The concept of very fast expansion towards the sphere that surrounded the region of space to secure all the planets that were infected by the berserkers, by this plague of madness, or were abandoned by them to attack the coalition and try to get to the broken heart. For 20 Terran years, from 696 to 816 millennium 39, or 4649 to 4799, the coalition was preparing significant military and colonization forces to just have a massive jump, long journey towards all the way to the sphere, securing everything in their path and making sure that this region of space will be safe. No threat could arrive uh, to uh, threaten the coalition if all region of, of space, from the broken heart all the way to the sphere, were under the coalition control. Massive fleets were built, armies were raised, and everything was prepared to move in giant wave, in a very similar way as the poles that brought chaos and madness into the region of space, the coalition planned to strike back. 
Heart, the Milky Way Galaxy cares not for great plans nor for ambitions of the little people. After all, the dream and the plan of the greatest of human race, the Emperor, was crushed like it was nothing. And Aun Tor would soon find out that he and his plans for a long journey are no different. In 4800, report arrived on the courier ships to the Tau homeworld. A massive orc war breached the sphere near the Kut space, and their capital ship was a size of a planetoid, and they were gunning towards the collision space on full speed. An hour later, another report came in. Another one was coming from Galactic South. Both seemingly directed towards the Broken Heart. All plans for expansion were abandoned in the blink of an eye. The orcs have arrived to lay claim to this region of space once again. The Fifth Coalition War just began. Yes, my darlings, another cliffhanger. Sorry about that, but I had to end the episode somewhere. I hope you enjoyed this unconventional episode where I focused so much time on, well, just explaining the environment of this region of space and not moving really that far in the timeline of the coalition. But I do hope you will forgive me. In next episode, we have another work with orcs. Round 2 Electric Boogaloo, if you will. <laughs> Well, my darlings, that's it for today. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed. Now, my dear, dear listeners, remember, wherever you are, whatever you do, try to enjoy yourself while you can. I wish you most... Critical day. Ta-ta!